<laughs> now, if you, if you make a quotation, of course, you should always be very careful about the context from which it comes, because very often, the, if you read the whole context, the meaning goes the other way around. But in this case, I think it's particularly appropriate for those of you who are very, very early on in your in your career, because the uh, complete quotation is as follows. Let's <laughs> <laughs> so. well, thank the organizers for asking me. They must have been rather desperate for some comic relief. <laughs> um, the, the first problem is they're called building barricades. And um, the name from Barry Sebra, he, he asked if he if you just take the numbers from one to n. Of course, if you take the partial sums, you just get the triangular numbers, 1, 3, 6, 10, and so on. But then he wants to know, can you then rearrange them so that the, uh, the partial sum has just covered all, all possibilities? Uh, that is, the um, take the, of the sum of the first n numbers, half n into n plus 1, minus 1, the number of uh, partial sums, that has to be divisible by uh, n minus 1, and um, uh, this, this, of course, is a half uh, n plus 2 into n minus 1, so a half of n plus 2 must be a, a whole number, so it would only work if n is even. But um, <coughs> if, you, if you arrange the numbers just in their natural order, as I say, you get triangular numbers, but if you rearrange them there you get partial sums 2, 5, 9, and here, and the, that arrangement, um, which I uh, prefer pictures, and uh, so you've got a nice wall, you build your wall so you make sure that where your, your lines of cement never come directly above one another, otherwise it'll weaken the wall somewhat. So. Um, so, um, and um, with n equals 2, I think you can easily see if 2 and 1 and 1 and 2 uh, is the unique solution there. Uh, with um, uh, n equals 4, Um, we get four, four solutions, and uh, the fourth one here uh, satisfies what I call the Fink condition, because um, uh, Alex Fink wanted to uh, arrange the thing in a more orderly fashion like this. So that... Okay. In trouble here. Are we? Um, so if you divide the divide your wall into uh, uh, n minus one uh, equal sections, then you have exactly one um, um, one join. At, at each level, and um, so that uh, those are all the solutions for n equals four, um, and uh, for n equals six, <coughs> the numbers of solutions uh, starts going up quite rapidly. And um, like all the like all the solutions which um, 
um, satisfy the fig condition, I call them balanced solutions, uh, you'll find for n equals 6, uh, there are something like 600 uh, solutions, and uh, 19 of which are, are balanced. And in fact, if you go on, uh, stick them on a machine, it, it's, it's just a little bit difficult to know how what you're counting, because uh, or clearly you don't count it differently if you just permute the, the rows, that doesn't make any difference. But you can also reflect from left to right, and uh, provided the number of rows is even, you can sort of rotate the thing and so on. So that uh, depending on what symmetries you allow, uh, the counting is a little bit difficult. But um, uh, so, so I've got someone put it on a machine and found uh, uh, for n equals 8, uh, 1684 solutions, and for n equals 10, there are about 4 million. So you may well ask, well, what's the problem? Um, well, the problem is prove that you could always do it. So it's typical of combinatorial problems is that you're, you're uh, looking for needles in a haystack, and although your number of needles is going up exponentially, your haystack is going, growing super exponentially, and uh, the needles get harder and harder to find. And as far as I know, no one can prove uh, that you can always build a barricade in this way. Um, there are some other other problems. You can ask, what what other multisets can you use to build a barricade? And then some of these make quite nice um, quite nice puzzles. So. Uh, Suppose you, take, suppose you take the numbers 1, 2, 3, 6, and 9, I'll leave you to uh, discover whether there is a solution uh, using uh, B5. Those add up to 21, so there are 20, 20 partial sums in there, and uh, there'll be four partial sums in these, four go to... If there is a solution, it involves... Uh, five rows, so I leave you to decide whether you can prove there is no solution or, or find one, but you can... Um, the uh, next one is uh, called the, the, the Cookie Monster problem. Um, I, I attribute this to Laura Larson, and he attributes it to me, but anyhow, it <laughs> arose in some way or other when we were uh, writing the book, The Inquisitive Problem Solver. Well, the cookie monster, he comes and there are, the, there are a lot of jars of cookies, and um, he, he, can, he can take any number of cookies, and he can choose any number of jars, his only restriction is that he is only allowed to take the same number of cookies from every jar that he selects. And the object is for him to empty the cookie jars in as few visits as possible. Um, so, um, supposing that there are four jars with uh, nine, five, four, and two cookies in them, uh, when you could empty the most jars out of them, which um, uh, of course as soon as two jars are equal in size you uh, you can treat them as just one one jar so that uh, um, <coughs> in, in a sense in a sense you <coughs> Uh, emptied uh, you, by, by taking five from each of the two first, first two jars, you reduce the number of jars from four down to two because um, one jar is obviously empty 
But uh, since you've now got two jars with four in them, you can treat that as a single jar. So, um, so you can do you can consume uh, nine plus five plus four plus two cookies and uh, three visits with that. But if you if you try now with um, um, 17, 16, 11, 4, 2, 1, um, you'll find that you need, uh, if you use, use uh, empty the most jars algorithm, you, you need to make at least five visits. So you instead you eat the most cookies uh, uh, algorithm. That is, uh, so you uh, uh, and you can uh, well, those those of you who draw um, what you what you call them uh, Ferrous diagrams or young tableau or something, you may have heard of Durfee squares and things. Uh, what, what what this is is you you select the biggest rectangle you can out of your thing. Biggest area rectangle that contains the most cookies. So if you eat the most cookies, you can you can consume 30, 33 cookies on the first visit, and uh, that brings it down to uh, six five four two one. And then uh, you can uh, consume uh, the twelve cookies by selecting uh, the six five four jars. And um, so that you can uh, you can manage it in four visits instead of five. Now supposing the uh, 36, 33, 5, 1, um, they empty the most jars and uh, eating the most cookies, um, both lead to this and lead a, a total of four visits. So we use the binary algorithm, which is you eat the biggest power of two uh, cookies from uh, from all those jars which have that, that number in, and you find that um, you can do that with three visits. Okay, well now we come to 11542 uh, well, eat the most, empty the most jars, or eat the most cookies, or the bio, bio, binary algorithm. They all take four visits, but you can. Visible here. You can do it in three visits. So, problem. What's find an algorithm which works in all cases? Uh, the last time John Conway came to uh, visit me, he amused himself on the plane with calculating what uh, we later called the subprime Fibonacci sequences. And um, he took the Fibonacci sequence of 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. And three and five makes eight, but uh, if the number was composite, he didn't. He had first of all divided by the smallest prime factor. So instead of eight, um, <coughs> he divide by two <coughs> and four. Now four and five makes nine. But nine is composite, so you divide by the smallest prime factor and write three instead. Uh, 4 and 3 is 7, that's fine. Uh, 3 and 7 is 10, but that's composite, so you divide by 2 and get 5. Uh, 5 and 7 is 12, and you divide by 2 is 6. 6 and 5 is 11, is prime, all right. 11 and 6 is 17, prime, okay. You keep going, and eventually you find yourself in a, an 18 cycle. Uh, of course, if you start with a, a diff different pair of numbers, uh, presumably something different happens. And um, 
So, does um, what what happens? Does this always end in a cycle, or can it go to infinity? <coughs> and it begins to look suspiciously like the three x plus one problem, which. Uh, uh, those of you who aren't familiar with it, or even those of you who are, uh, will, then will like to see um, uh, Jeff Ligarius's very nice uh, compendium that the American Math Society published a couple of years ago now, uh, The Ultimate Challenge, the 3x plus 1 problem. And uh, I strongly recommend that for light reading when you want. Well, um, we did a lot of experimenting uh, with this. Um, uh, Conway believes there are only a finite number of cycles. When I, I wrote, when I first made this uh, transparency, I wrote that I thought there were infinitely many cycles, but I'm beginning to come around to Conway's point of view, as a matter of fact. Um, If you start one, four, five, and, and so on, <coughs> you, uh, you end in a 136 cycle. Uh, if you start 25, 26, uh, you get into a 19 cycle. If you start from 100 and 101, it leads to a, a 56 cycle. And uh, that, that was all done by hand. Uh, but um, uh, uh, Tanya Kovanova got, got interested in this problem, and she put it on a machine and found a, a 10 cycle and an 11 cycle. Not particularly large numbers, but um, so we know we know of six cycles so far. Perhaps that's it. And uh, perhaps it never goes to infinity, but it, it, this seems impossible to prove. And as I say, it may be as hard as the 3x plus 1 problem. But um, I did some sort of probabilistic calculations, and it seems to me that if you, if you only take uh, prime divisors which are not too big, then, uh, of course, you obviously increase the chances it's going to go to infinity. And it's clear that if you only uh, divide even numbers by two, uh, it's easy to see it always goes to infinity. And even if you only use the divisors two and three, then <coughs> it's, it's fairly clear that it goes to infinity. But I, I believe that somewhere around about 13, if you only use the divisors up to 13, and if, if a, a number was composite but its smallest prime factor was bigger than 13, you, you lift it alone and carry it on. Uh, it may be that some sequences go to infinity. But uh, this may be impossibly difficult anyway. Uh, right, well. For uh, those of you who don't want to uh, be involved in quite such frivolous activities as <coughs> the ones that I've been mentioning so far, let's, uh, let's have a look at a, a theorem of Sagier, uh, published in a, in a Book, uh, a Springer book in German about uh, Zeta von Duren, um, which uh, since, since most people speak only one language these days, there's desperate need in having a translation of this. Um, but in, in the, near the end of this book, he's produced a remarkable um, 
remarkable theorem. If P is a prime congruent to 3 mod 4, not 3 itself, and the, the class number of the uh, field the Q root P is 1, because that's a famous unsolved problem of its own. It is, Everybody knows that three quarters of the, of the these primes they have class number one, but nobody can even prove that there's infinite number. Anyhow, so it's a, it's a non-trivial theorem. Um, if the if the class number of uh, Q root P is is one, then the class number of the corresponding imaginary quadratic field. So I'm denoted by H minus, is given by this remarkable uh, magic number, as I call it. It's so one third of the sum of the partial quotients minus the number of partial quotients in the negative continued fraction expansion of root P. So that is if uh, root P is A, A sub zero minus. 1 over a sub 1 minus 1 over a, all minus signs and sort of the usual regular ones. Um, it's, it's rather astounding in, in the first place that, that this, should be, this should be a whole number in, in the first place to begin with is to, is to show that that is a whole number. But, um, but observing uh, Observing uh, other <coughs> other cases where the, uh, uh, the class number was not one, uh, but, uh, keep keep the keep the primes to be the, the ones congruent to three mod four. Um, then it seems, from having looked at fairly large number of uh, examples, that uh, the I take the product of H plus and H minus, so that um, since the in the original theorem H plus was one, this is simply this is just H minus. But if I take the product of these two, then that differs from the magic number, of course, by zero in the original theorem, but it differs by zero or eight mod sixteen, according as the uh, Class number of the of the real of the field is plus or minus one or plus or minus three mod eight. Um, I've tried to sell this to uh, several people, and uh, uh, there's some people in, actually in this room who uh, managed to diverge off and try and uh, prove something slightly different and. We get get involved with uh, uh, other other values instead of taking primes, they're taking products of two primes and so on. And made a certain amount of progress, which uh, they may talk about later. I don't know, but um, anyhow, that's that's the all I have time for at the moment. <laughs>